Hello friends and family and welcome to our boring meditation stuff for Sunday, November 1st. It's a new month and Halloween is over and I'm still talking about The Legend of Zelda. <laughs> um, this is, uh, in case you didn't watch the previous video, this is a thought that I've had for a while about the possibility of taking the paper that I wrote, Vipassana for Hackers, and kind of changing it um, around so that it was accessible to gamers instead of hackers. Um, though I think most people are hackers, uh, not everyone's a gamer. Um, and the two games that immediately come to mind are uh, two of my favorite Zelda games from when I was a kid. Um, the second being uh, Ocarina of Time. And Ocarina of Time, I actually I couldn't sleep recently, uh, thanks to the pandemic probably. Um, and so I sat down and I watched a, an analysis video on YouTube. That's how you know that you have an insomnia, when <laughs> you're watching video game analysis videos. Um, but the video was about Ocarina of Time and how it has these uh, threads of subtext in the story um, and uh, the way that they're woven together into kind of a complete story. And I thought it was actually quite a good video. I'll link to it at the end of this uh, thing. Um, and thinking back to when I played that game as, I guess, a teenager, actually, a young teenager, um, it was, it was very complete. And I think, um, to the two subtext threads that they discuss in this video are one, the subtext of nature. Um, there, they lean on Shintoism, uh, so a Shintoist um, perspective of nature, but I think everyone understands nature um, in its honest form. I mean, when you start describing gods and magic and <laughs> things like that, then, um, then it divides up into its various religions, but um, even those have their parallels between different belief structures. Um, and then the other subtext thread is this uh, thread of Link, the hero, um, growing up and getting old. So there's uh, a midpoint in the game where he actually transitions from being a child to a full-grown man. Um, and uh, there's a lot of dialogue with the... Um, the other characters in the game regarding his development and growth. And there are all sorts of um, images of, uh, of this transition into adulthood. And of course, the transition from childhood to adulthood uh, is mirrored in all our transitions in life. So we transition from being a young adult and um, being healthy and attractive and <laughs> energetic. And then life starts to wear on us and we get older, our health begins to wane, our energy begins to wane, and we become something else and we reach middle age. And then we transition from middle age into uh, early old age. And then we transition from early old age into our final stages of life. And the transitions uh, of life, these natural transitions, which everyone must participate in, um, they are discussed in the theory of meditation. But meditation itself uh, practice of meditation doesn't really say anything about these transitions. It just says uh, it's there, <laughs> this transition. And it's moving along and 
uh, it's, it's passing from one state into another state into another state into another state. And um, the technique of Vipassana uh, suggests that the interesting thing about this is seeing as accurately and as closely as possible each of these transitions. So from one moment to the next moment, not from childhood to early adulthood or from middle age to early old age, um, or that final transition uh, from life to death. Um, meditation rather says, oh, okay, take, rather than these big clumpy <laughs> transitions, take the tiniest transition possible and initially we're not particularly good at that. So our initial transitions are fairly coarse grained. They tend to be uh, the length of a breath. Sometimes if we're distracted for seconds or minutes at a time, um, they're, they are that long. So the transition is from five minutes ago till now. Oh, where was my mind? Oh, I was wandering around. <laughs> All right, come back, do this thing with the breath again. Um, so a five minute chunk is yeah, it's pretty big um, on the scale of meditation. But of course, then when we think about, we think about literature, we think about poetry, we think about epics, we think about video games, art of any kind, and we think about these huge scales, right? generation to generation and from childhood to adulthood, these sorts of very gross, easily accessible um, transitions that everyone makes. And um, the reason to lean on them is because they're, they're both accessible in the sense that we all know them to be true. We're each getting older. Um, I'm getting older, you're getting older, and we had a younger version of us somewhere back there that, <laughs> that we remember to some degree. We remember that, that person's experiences and we remember that life. And if we take what can often seem in retrospect like quite a long time scale, um, and then we juxtapose these two things, oh yes, childhood, adulthood. Uh, birth, death, you know, those sorts of, um, then we tend to get this, uh, this reified image that anyone can understand and anyone can appreciate as true. Ah, yes, change. Change is constantly there. This is a continuous process of change. And so these themes in Ocarina of Time, um, they're universal and they exist in, of course, every religion, every literary tradition, every artistic tradition. Um, but again, as I said yesterday, there is a certain magic to actually playing through this, <laughs> to be the hero, to be the, the first person uh, perspective in this particular art form. And, um, It's, it's a bit jarring in some ways um, because we don't get that first person perspective in our own lives. Uh, we don't jump ahead into the future by seven years and all of a sudden we're a man or a full grown woman or we're getting old. <laughs> um, we make these tiny, tiny increments whether we're paying attention or not. And so this practice of meditation is to pay attention to these tiny, tiny increments, these tiny, tiny increments, um, and to see what's going on in between. And what's funny about that is then we can actually see the, the broader time span much more clearly. Oh, okay, what is my life actually? Like, where am I coming from and where am I going? Why? <laughs> um, and I think that that's actually... That's a, a question that art forms um, 
often not, not video games so often, but many art forms will try to address this why of life. Why am I here? What am I doing? Why do I exist? Um, and this pursuit of an answer to that question um, is, is fun as a mental exercise. It's kind of a curiosity and a play thing. Um, if it's a video game or if it's a, a beautiful book or even a beautiful painting, um, a beautiful song, uh, gives us a play space, a mental play space where we can say, ah, oh, okay, yes, <laughs> the whys and the hows of the universe, they seem to be aligning in this framework. But of course, those frameworks video game or painting are, are all artificial and it is difficult to find many real uh, examples of the why of life um, we get some some reified uh, coarse grained examples we can say well why life and then we can say well our friends and our family and meaningful work and all of those sorts of things service to our community um, but uh, it is it is not very easy for us to actually um, disassemble uh, those things so okay the component why of why do I love my family? Or the component why of why do I find this work meaningful is, uh, is actually very difficult. <laughs> um, and as soon as we start dissolving those things, they are no longer reified. Then it becomes an intellectual exercise again, a kind of um, poking and prodding uh, mentally to see if we can um, get to the end of this intellectual game and that is where vipassana meditation differs so vipassana meditation gives you this tool for for slicing up time shaving off little bits as they come and investigating them one at a time and that's precisely what you're doing um i think that there is uh there there is a related thread um, between Ocarina of Time and Vipassana, which is that the, uh, the word used in English most often is nature. So in Pali, it's Dhamma, which is, it's a very complicated word. <laughs> um, and it does not translate to nature. Um, it translates into probably dozens of English words um, and some of them very far flung, but nature is one of the more accessible words that we can translate it into. So we can say, oh, okay, uh, we're investigating the nature, the singular nature, the nature of the universe, the nature of this body, um, whatever it is that... Uh, constitutes me, <laughs> a person. So I have all this meat and electrical impulses and, uh, and gray matter and whatever else is going on inside here, that this is a component of nature and that it's comprised of all the same things that my bookshelf and my computer and um, the deep sea uh, telecommunications cables <laughs> are comprised of and the ocean itself and the earth. Um, and our sun, that uh, all of these things are quite unified in their nature and that dissolving uh, nature is meant to uncover smaller bits. So we're pulling apart smaller bits and we're trying to see nature for what it is. Um, in this way, it differs from uh, the Zelda series, obviously, because the Zelda series takes on this kind of high level sort of cartoonish view of nature um, there's a 
there's a god-like or demigod-like um, tree in the forest and, and things like that and fairies and sprites and whatnot. Um, and even a single tree is quite, that's a gross instance of nature. Um, we're interested in the, the much more subtler parts of nature, but the, uh, the fundamental investigation um, is the same. So um, I'll, I'll see if I can transform this concept into something more meaningful. It would be, uh, I think, clearer if I actually wrote it down, but thank you for letting me experiment with this idea across two videos. And if you got this far, being patient enough to listen to me talk about it. <laughs> All right, I hope everyone is taking good care of themselves and good care of one another. I will talk to you again tomorrow. Goodbye.